Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And you know, it almost makes sense that my final episode of this year of this series is ending with this project. Because, like this show, it's a little overlong, scattered, occasionally poignant, and might just reveal a few surprises along the way. But unlike last year with 80s hardcore punk, I can't all but feel like I only really scratched the surface of this era within hip-hop, despite covering 12 albums. Now part of this is a more crowded scene with broader digital distribution at the time that led to so many more albums getting released. Part of it was that, in comparison with the birth of the scene and the sound, underground hip-hop around the turn of the millennium was more of a fork in the road for an established genre, a tributary that's been sliding back and forth across the mainstream rap really ever since. It goes in and then goes out again. But with this, yeah, this is an album that even in the most favorable time it has been for emo rap, I doubt would have received any sort of broader play. A singular entity from a singular artist and one that I've reviewed several times here before. It's time we go back to the beginning. This is 2002's Personal Journals by Sage Francis, and this is Resonators. And more importantly, this is not a project I'm going to be discussing alone, especially when the man himself can weigh in. And we are here on second time around, although you guys don't know that, with the rapper, the underground legend, the beast behind the mic with the heart of gold, Sage Francis. How's it going, Oh, man? good. How are you, Mark? I am very good. Uh, just to provide a little bit of context for the viewers here, this is actually the second time we are making this interview recording. We actually had something a, a really good conversation that went over really well, but it got lost to the ether thanks to uh, technical glitches on my side. Yeah, I mean, I always expect stuff like that to happen, so no sweat. But now you'll never know what was potentially lost in throughout the without throughout the sands of time. So just to provide a little context, we're going to be going back to his debut album on Anticon and discussing a little bit more in detail the project Personal Journals. Um, first off, I want to say that I'm very grateful that Sage Francis stepped up here to actually have this opportunity. I've reviewed him a number of times before. Personal Journals, though in comparison with the other projects in which I've discussed from him, um, it's a little bit different, and I feel like I feel like there needs to be some historical context established. Because you were coming from the battle rap scene to some of your mixtapes to the album proper. Um, can you describe how your change in creative process went? Well, that time was so busy and just very uh, concentrated life and art and you know young adulthood and trying to make sense of you know I, <laughs> going from college to work and trying to figure out really how i'm gonna live my life um so i would say from the battle scene and also the spoken word scene and the mixtape stuff and realizing okay there is a way to make some money off of this. Maybe I don't need to work a nine to five job. Maybe I, if I dedicate myself to um, trying to live off of my music, I actually can, which was uh, pretty unheard of for anybody in my area, uh, in, in my situation. But um, when it came time to do personal journals, I definitely had several recordings under my belt. I had a couple mixtapes under my belt. I had a lot of touring under my belt and it was like finally the time for the official album to drop. So there was a lot of life and preparation that went into that album, which I knew would set the standard or at least become the launching pad for everything that comes after it. So I took it very seriously. And I also, as I think I, I mentioned in the liner notes or maybe even in the press statement when it came out, it was like, this is the album I needed to make if I was never to make another album again in my whole life. So lay it all out on table and um, make sure I include the serious, make sure I include the quirky, make sure I include, you know, other elements of my life that could have been lost to time, but thankfully I, I preserved them and um, they are present on personal journals. 
Following off of though, like you said, this is you had some hype going into this. You had the mixtape run up. You had you're you at you're coming off a couple of big battles, and you were coming into this project specifically that it could be the only project that you you described that as one potentially the only one you ever put out. Did you really believe that in the back of your mind that it could be your only one? I, I think I went into everything like that. <laughs> I mean, what if this is my last battle? Do I really, mm. you know? What if this is the last time I get to say or do something? I, I want it to be, I don't know, I want to make my mark. Um, so that was just my mentality. And it was a very, I was scraping by at the time. And I, it was, everything was very serious. I mean, I know there's a lot of humor there and there, there is a quirkiness, but it was a very serious time and a desperate time. And I think that probably translates um, on the album. So I did go into it thinking, hell, you know, I'm not promised anything else. I never thought I was actually going to have a record, like a full mm. studio album available in stores that people could go to a store and there's a Sage Francis section. <laughs> that was never, I mean, I was just so mind blowing. So I never took anything for granted. I was, I took very, I took it very seriously. Okay, so coming off of that, this was it was your only project that was released upon Anticon at the time, and you had the EP that came out a little bit afterwards. Then you had the um, nonprofit stuff that was on, an, I believe you said previously it was Lex, right? Correct. Yeah. So, can you describe to me a little bit of what the relationship you had was with Anticon and how that built out from there? My Anticon. Um relationships i i would say was new england affiliated because soul mm -hmm. um who had kind of spearheaded the anticon movement was living at Ma living in maine at the time as was uh alias who i ended up working throughout my career uh, on different material with but um he was still in maine dj mayonnaise was still in maine um and there was a couple others who were in the new england area um that was just before they all moved to the Bay Area and, you know, had their collective all living inside of a warehouse, which I visited eventually when I was to do the Personal Journals album. But we had a contentious origin and there was a lot of shit talk in the hip hop scene, especially in the underground scene where, you know, white kids were always feeling like they needed to prove themselves and, you know, we were sick of being called Vanilla Ice, so we needed to, like, really <laughs> get away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, no, when we find out someone else, some other, like, weird old white kid was doing music in your general area, it's like, you obviously have to slay him because there can be only one. So, I, in a weird way, I mean, I'm not literally, but I was, you know, that kind of was under the surface, and I think it is for a lot of people or was at the time so at first we weren't friends in fact the only dude who was like super cool with me was was um bren alias he was always very nice and um i think in 90 1998 we did our first song together and it was just, it never was released but it was kind of like just messing around anyways because the way anticon went about their music i think was very i, I would I, I hate saying beat beatnik it, but they kind of had this just go with the flow kind of thing. And I was always more of a, I need a lot of time to prepare and I want to make sure everything is, is, is structured properly. That's always just, that's, I'm very neurotic mm -hmm. and that's how I go about my stuff, but being introduced to them and eventually I think carrying favor with them over time and me loosening up about them too, because I was a very, I was very rooted in, Fundament, fundamental hip hop and um, and the way it's supposed to sound and all, what the rules are. And Anticon was all about breaking all of that. And and um, I dug that too because coming from the spoken word scene as well, that was my separation. That was my other world that I got to live in where I was able to explore things that weren't fully accepted in hip hop. And then for me to finally, I think, bridge the gap or bring them both together. Um, I could find my own voice and contribute something that I, I feel is unique or was original in, in the hip hop realm. So building off of that, were those primarily online connections or did you actually meet a lot of those guys in person? 
Um, they were heavily online at the time, as was I, and this was in the beginning stages of the internet, but um, I had a college radio show that I invited him down to, and that's also how my name started getting out beyond my my little small region in Rhode Island um, because I would talk a lot of shit on the radio <laughs> <laughs> and then other people would hear about it and they'd get upset. They'd want to come visit me at my radio station and I would say, I have an open door policy here, so come on down. <laughs> That's now dangerous. It, it was dangerous. There was a couple times we had to shut down the show, but um, that was a fun time. It was like, I don't know. It's it's a... Um, it's not, it was a very unique time period. It's something that I don't think could ever be replicated the way we live now. So do you think in terms of some of that side, you were also coming out of the hardcore punk scene. Some of that scene was coming around as well. And you see flashes of that across personal journals in terms of some of the acoustic sounds that come in, in terms of some of the more organic elements and some of the rougher DIY side. Was there any act in particular that was inspiring you or were you just more just trying to root yourself in that space or be more like Anticon and break boundaries? Yeah, I mean, the, my my experience with hardcore and the punk scene was not totally me loving the music, but me appreciating and respecting the scene ah. that friends of mine had introduced me to. Because at the time, and I would say this was 95, 96, mostly 96, when... Anything that was hip hop, I didn't want to be bothered with. It had mm. to be, it was hip, all hip hop all the time. And I, it was like that way my whole life, right up until 96, when my friends urged me to finally check out the hardcore shows and um, the punk scene. And that's when I was introduced to the idea that, okay, you don't need a major label in order to create um, product or release music you can actually take it in your own hands. Of course, it won't look as official. It's not glossy. It's not clean. But, but it's real. Yeah, it's real. And, it, and what's more important is that you you put yourself into something and make it available to people, and then they can riff off of that and do their own thing. And then you have this like a symbiotic relationship between everyone who understands that, the, you know, <laughs> the capitalist world of, of music and the industry in itself is... is filled with way too many gatekeepers and leaving a lot of creativity out of the mix. So um, I was, I'm very grateful that I was exposed to that at that time period, because by the time we got to the late nineties um, and hip hop's independent scene was popping off incredibly people were releasing uh, 12 inches on their own, the, you know, uh, vinyl singles was a big thing because DJs, hip hop DJs were still spinning vinyl. In fact, you can credit them for keeping the vinyl industry alive. So all these people now that are benefiting off of the vinyl boom, it would not exist if, if hip hop was not the ones who continue to push the vinyl shit. But um, so I, I, I kind of, I saw what Anticon was doing on the business side of things, which was great to me. You know, they had an infrastructure I was not able to build on my own and I was able to utilize. And I had a fan base. I had built a fan base who was very hungry to get us an official Sage Francis album. And Anticon eventually was willing to put that out. And um, that just, it exploded. Cause at the time it just was, my name was all over the place, but my records weren't in stores. So once it was, and that's a, that's strange to say now because who cares about if your records in a store in 2019, but back then that was a big deal. Oh, that mattered for sure. So I think a lot of the distribution came from there and that's, one of the reasons you went over to Lex with nonprofits, you thought that there would be some UK crossover op opportunities there. Yeah, I always had a strong fan base in the UK, and mm -hmm. um, I also thought that the nonprofits album was was almost the polar opposite of what the Personal Journals album was. So I, in my head, it just didn't make any sense to be on Anticon because, for the most part, it embodied everything I thought Anticon was against, and that was just like punchlines and pop culture references and you know praising the fundamentals of hip-hop and you know mm -hmm. the pioneers of hip-hop whereas they created a world that was like what if the, what if it's a whole other thing you know which <laughs> is great really mm -hmm. but so it just at that time uh the non the hope album was not like uh, to me it wasn't an anticon record and Lex had approached me, Warp Records, actually, because Lex was a subsidiary of, of Lex. Lex was, didn't even exist yet. Mm. But um, 
they were they were kind of getting in my ear. They brought me out, I think, to um, a London show, and I was very green and naive at the time, and I was, I signed off on a contract I shouldn't have, and it's probably why a lot of people who are into my stuff don't even know about that record or can't find it. But um, hey, you know, it's I make mistakes, but I also you know I've I've learned from them. Speaking on some of that, you've got some of, like, uh, going to one thing that I don't think gets highlighted enough when it comes to a lot of your work as an MC, because you've got a diehard audience that will appreciate the honesty, the vulnerability, the thoughtfulness that is uh, that's very much apparent in your rhymes, on, but, but also has that level of depth. But you've got a braggadocious and more fun, quirky side that comes through as well, and you get that across songs like Personal Journalist off of Personal Journals. So I'm looking at that, and you've, you've described it before as being playful. Like, you're throwing some shots out, you're baiting the competition a little bit. Yeah, well, that's, what, that's what inspired me to uh, become a hip-hop head in the first place. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a kid, what really, a big draw was the braggadocious side of hip-hop um, and the rhymes. So both of them, just, uh, just talking about how great you are, how bad the other person is, you know, the proverbial <laughs> other person. Whoever it is, it, you know, yeah. that, it didn't matter. Did you actually get of a course, response that actually came off of the album, off of personal journals? Uh, from what? Like, like, did, like any other like, person? Like somebody saw some of the some of the calling out for competition. They're like, okay, I'm gonna go at him. Mm, not really, nah. <laughs> um, maybe I didn't give him a chance because I just was moving so fast forward that it just mm-hmm. at that time, I don't know. Cause I had made a name in the, in the battle scene anyways. And if people wanted to battle, I was, I kind of, they had their opportunity already. And I wouldn't say there's any battle songs on personal journals, but mm-hmm. um, it's just fun sometimes to have those, those lines that punch like one line here or there that just says, yeah, you know, rappers are arrogant. I happen to be a rapper and here's a, mm-hmm. here's an arrogant line for no reason at all. So, okay, so coming off some of those moments, would you have liked somebody in particular to have come, to clap back at you at the time? I would have loved it. I mean, I would have absolutely loved it. I, I don't think there's any time where someone was like, when that came out, I just was so, I was coming in hot. So I was like, you know, anyone who wants to talk it's uh, or, or clap or whatever. They're going to get the smoke. Yeah, it's fine. That's it's a good time. It's it was a good time for that. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I I was I was just moving like I said, fast forward. I was doing as much as I could with any format that I could, trying to stay on top of the, the rapid changes of of hip hop and the industry and the internet and um and I also, like I said before, knew that nothing was promised and I didn't take anything for granted. So any opportunities that they were for me to um, make the best business decisions possible so that I could live off of my music and not go back to serving ice cream, <laughs> you know, it's it a pretty big deal. I, I also had like, I graduated from from university and I had no interest in pursuing a career that had anything to do with my degree. Um, yeah you know it 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 just so when you see when people are paying you to express yourself and you had already dedicated the bulk of your life to this craft you take those opportunities and make the most of them and i i had seen so many people pass those opportunities by thinking they were too good for this too good Mm -hmm. for that and eventually or quickly they just got you know left in the you know past um and that could happen to me at any time and maybe it already has i'm not Mm. every album is a test every single time i i do a show it's a test like do five people show up or do 500 people show up i i never know i don't know all i know is that i'm going to continue to push myself try to impress myself with what i do Mm -hmm. and have a blind faith that there's an audience out there who identifies with with that spirit the internet makes that a lot easier too. It sure does, and Just, I'm very grateful that the internet came when it did because at that point in my life, I, you know, it was really important for me to know that there were people out there who identified with my music. 
pushing that, because I can imagine pushing a sound like yours in 92 would be very different than pushing in 2002. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, I mean, I remember trying to do it in 92, and I thought that was my last chance. I was like, all right, I'm 14 years old. <laughs> this is the peak of my hip-hop life. You know, uh, crisscross was popping off all the, like, little kid bands. You could whatever. beat those guys. <laughs> but that was my, I was like, listen, I'm a white kid who can rap fast. It's 1992. This hip-hop shit, who knows what's going to happen. I got to do it now. And I had, mm -hmm. a, I had a manager. Um I reference in one of my songs that I, I think uh, it's uh, Underground for Dummies, the first song on Human the Death Dance. But I, I talk about what does a manager do? And this guy, um, you know, one of them wanted to exploit my whiteness because, you know, yeah. there was obviously a path. If you could do it correctly, there's a big audience out there who's like, I don't like a lot of hip hop, but I do like that one white guy, you know. So yep. <laughs> it was people who were aware that that was out there. And there was also the, like, we need to hide the fact that you're white because, you know, it's not, that's not popular in hip hop. So I, <clears throat> I kind of dealt with both kind of managers and I was so young at the time. I had no clue mm -hmm. what any of it really mattered. All I wanted to do was get my music out there. Neither of them could do it for me. And that's when I gave up on managers. I think I was in my early teens. You're ahead and, of most people. Yeah. You know, again, I, I am... I benefited from the things that happened in my life when they happened in my life. And a lot of the stuff I didn't have control over. Um, I am just, I count, you know, my lucky stars that it all happened the way that it did so that I could end up where I am. Okay. So let's go into some of the, let's go into some of the deeper, slightly more serious elements that come off of personal journals. Cause Across there, one thing you've described to me is that there was a lot of recordings that you had hoarded over the years, just in terms of family, in terms of your own backfield recordings. And it was integrated into telling a lot of family stories that were coming off of that. Now, granted, there's always going to be some level of abstraction and deeper and elements that are more that where there's always more beneath the surface. And we'll get more into that. But the one thing that I've noticed is that you go to some pretty tough places when it comes to questions of family, your parents, um, your sister, and how did they react? Um, <clears throat> well, like I mentioned before, I, I, I kept my, my hip hop recordings and my, my aspirations, uh, mm -hmm. secret from my family, uh, for a very long time. And, right until personal journals came out, I wasn't even sure if any of them really knew to what level I was doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, of course, at that time I was in national publications and local publications. So there was no hiding the fact that I had material out there that now they were going to listen to and realize, Oh wow, he's talking a lot of things about a lot of stuff. <laughs> and mm. I think, I think the only person who ever, took issue with it was was my um my grandmother um on my my father's side who i think felt like i was attacking my dad and that's her son so i shouldn't do that um but at the same time and like i explained to her i did apologize if she felt hurt because i that was not any intention but i said he's my dad <laughs> Actually, experience. he's not my dad. He was my father. And um, I have some things that I think if I talk about a lot of people who've gone through this will benefit from it and feel like they're not alone in something that I had felt alone in for most of my life. So that superseded any fear I may have had about not addressing certain topics because it might annoy or hurt someone within my like family sphere. Um, and I felt like it was important for me to do that at that time when I did it, because I did feel like for me to be as creative and free as possible, I had to eliminate that fear from my creative process of, oh, don't want to uh, upset that person, don't want them to feel like they might be insulted. No, all of that could not be a part of, of what I do and what I create. The creation and the art was number one for me. And um, it's not always like that, but at that time it was like that. 
But you were getting to a very raw place with some of those songs, like some ve- a very raw, very intimate place. And to stay in that place, to perform it effectively, do you feel that it left some of those questions open? Or do you think that it gave you some distance? I suppose it gave me some distance. I also, I think it gives you control or an illusion of control mm-hmm. over what you address. You turn it into something mm-hmm. that you're in charge of. So, and um, psychologically speaking, I think that that is um, important. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I wasn't a psych major, but <laughs> I also know that if you never talk about certain things, it can fester and uh, destroy you. So... Um, so getting it out probably really helped. I I would like to think so, but also it wasn't always about me. Like I said, one thing I loved about hip hop is that they were talking about things that I didn't hear about in any other genre, um, and it was it was special and it made me feel less alone. And I wanted to do the same for anyone who might come across my own music. So I I don't know if I consciously go into my writing process like that Mm -hmm. but um i know it is part of the process so in a case when you're performing songs from oh first off i should ask a question do you still perform songs from personal journals live yes i definitely do i i I try to perform uh songs throughout my whole catalog even going back to 97 which which is crazy and silly because (laughs) i am not that person anymore so i'm basically covering my own material at this point in my life um but there are songs there are I, I think there's just a couple songs in every project that I do that is good for live performance because mm-hmm. a live performance I go into that a whole lot differently than I do in making an album um, there's there's like things to consider about how you work with the energy of a crowd in a live environment and their involvement in your show and if I was just to do a Maybe someday I'll do a full personal journals performance. I've never done that. I mean, there's several songs on personal journals that I've never done live. Mm. But, um, and there's also some that are very tough to do live that I tend to do every show. Like Crack Pipes is a, is a, is a, is a song that I do pretty much at every show. It's something I, I really like to perform. Um, Inherited Scars. I've had issues performing that before. I've actually, you know, if, if I'm not careful and I tap into the origin of what certain lyrics, what inspired certain lyrics, I can lose myself in the performance and um, it affects me and it affects the performance. And maybe to some people that's a cool part of a performance, but that's not what I like to do. <laughs> I, like, I, I want to perform the song and not get caught up in it and and be attacked by my own song. So. Did it ever get to, did it ever get to a point where you were like as you were traveling with your band a lot around that time and they show up on the uh My Name is Strange and for right. some of the background when you do your uh, Bob Seger parody which is just perfectly placed on that album. Um did they ever like when you if you ever got at a point where you got caught up in a performance were they ever at a point where they're like you okay man like like can we help you? <laughs> um no, I guess the only time that really happens is when I'm, I, I'm doing a solo performance, not mm. when, I'm, when I'm with a band. And this, this is also why I'm not super in love with performing with a band um, when I'm doing hip hop material. It just, I, I know that it can have a bigger sound and the production value is greater at a live show. Mm-hmm. It's not my preference though. Like it, as, as me as a performer and, and what it, I feel restrictions by it. I feel restricted by it. I don't like it. So um, I do both. I do a little bit of both. I try to dabble in both, but or the band stuff. And I've I've been lucky to have worked with a lot of incredibly talented musicians. But after twenty years, over twenty years of doing both live band, DJ stuff, and also just purely solo stuff, I can say my preference is just to go totally solo, and. That way I can steer the show whichever way I want at whatever moment and give nobody any kind of indication of what's about to happen. And I know how to proceed without someone throwing up their arms like, what What? what are you doing? You know, we didn't practice this. Yeah. And that that's helpful just to have that a little, that 
that degree of comfort and control of the audience. Well, not really control of the audience, but be able to set the vibe. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I trust myself in those environments much more than I do anyone else. And if someone else is on my stage, which I can be very territorial about, <laughs> um, <laughs> then I have to put them into consideration when really I don't, I don't want to put them into consideration. I just want to talk my shit. All right. So on the topic of talking shit, let's get to one of the bigger elephants with regards to personal journals. Let's talk feminism. <laughs> and because there are some songs on this album that I, that are challenging, I think to an audience that does not know you and is not familiar with, with how your material might come across, like Smoke and Mirrors, for instance. Smoke and Mirrors, I've always perceived that as being more complex than a lot of people give it credit, but there are lines on that song that, for those who are not familiar with you, might surprise you, might surprise them. <laughs> yeah, um, that song in particular, I think, is often misinterpreted, um, but because... I, I kind of leave the option open for it to be taken several different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm, at its core, it's a persona piece, but you could consider it coming from a trans person. You could consider it coming from an old woman. You could consider it coming from... was uh, superficial, superficial mm -hmm. people who try to mask it by um, covering it up with a lot of different elements in their material life and social life. And um, it wasn't something that I thought was going to win a Nobel Prize or anything, but it was the first song I did for personal journals because I, ha I had already written it in my notebook before I went to California to do the album. Right. And the beat that Jell gave me, those lyrics fit to it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this and see what other people think. It's, I mean, everyone, I think, listened to it and said, oh, great. Sage is doing a fucking rap song. <laughs> do you think, do you think, okay, do you think people would interpret the song differently coming from you than if it came from, let's say, a female MC? Uh, yes, but. Mm -hmm. They would take it differently if it came from Rakim. You know, they would take True. it differently if it came from, from, uh, that's funny. I don't know any new rappers. I was going to say someone, <laughs> I forget their name, but anyways, yeah, it, it all, that context, I think it, although as an artist, you want to think it doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter. It's just art. It matters who it comes from because that does give the listener context, um, as to what they've done in the past, what their personal history is, what may have inspired certain lyrics, or what their overall intent is. So I was very early on, I feel like I was one of the people in hip hop who was willing to risk his um, credibility in hip hop by defending gay rights mm -hmm. and um, speaking up for the disenfranchised who often were made fun of in hip hop songs. And that context is important when you listen to a song like smoke and mirrors, because had I not already done that, or if I wasn't part of that culture in any way, yeah. You know, if it came from, I don't want to name names, but whatever, uh, you know, I, okay. I understand where you're coming from. I think where it comes, I think I always picked up on that song because you're primarily speaking from the pronoun I is used. It's not a she is doing all these things. It's an I that's doing all these things. So it's, it's placing yourself in that person's shoes and there's a level of empathy that, yeah. that comes through. But again, like the way you preface this when in regard to feminism or mm -hmm. even um, uh if someone is being misogynistic, which I've been accused of many times. And that's because I think a lot of my earlier songs that became popular were charged by a breakup mm. and me addressing an ex. And the fact that my ex is a girl means all the pronouns were her and she. Yeah. And I directed a lot of angst and hatred. Not, I wouldn't say hatred, but frustration and mm little my i was a little man about it i was a very little man and and i knew that too but i also knew there was like 
this is how people think. This is actually what people say in these in these situations. How creatively can I do it, but also not not champion it? Like I I think it's a it's a it's a problem when people listen to certain songs and think that I am championing what the song is about. <laughs> if mm. that makes any sense. You're trying to get to I'm a actually, point of relatability, not aspiration. I'm putting it on display. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this, you know, this, this is how it is. A, this is how it is. And I know it's small of me to say certain things, but um but also uh you know when Stephen King writes a writes a novel, he's not a serial killer. True. He does explore characters. He does explore traits in people. And um, I like to do that in my music as well. But I, of course, it's inspired by certain things in my life. Mm-hmm. But um, the poetic license that one uses when, when being creative allows you actually to do a character that is not necessarily a hero. Very fair, and and it's especially all the more common in hip hop, given its roots and where it was coming from. Right, and I was careful about that, and I did want to address that on personal journals because mm-hmm. it was an incredibly misogynistic. It still is an incredibly misogynistic genre, mm-hmm. and I felt like if I was part of a scene where women did feel more included, and they mm-hmm. didn't feel like they were being attacked, they didn't feel like they were being targeted, they didn't feel like they were being just arm pieces they were Mm -hmm. part of the community and um like songs like broken wings a lot that unintentionally i was wasn't going for this i wasn't like let's really like let's win over a lot of women but once i made that song it was incredible how many people contacted me and said that song is about me that song is about me you know i i've i've suffered through this i've dealt with this um you know thank you so much bob but i'm like that's awesome. It was un- an unintended result of that song, but the mm-hmm. fact that so many people related to it and told me they were helped by it, awesome. But also there's many strippers who have contacted me and say that's their song that they dance to. I'm like, that wasn't the point of the song, but <laughs> you go. You go. Especially you consider- you- especially considering, there, in my opinion, at least from what I perceived in the album, there's always a deeper sense of empathy that's persistent like you're not one to frame anybody with without calling them inhuman like you're not someone you're not someone to deny somebody's humanity wherever they come from right well well and that actually leads to one point i actually want to go into a little bit and it comes into the this is one point i've been doing a little reading and research about this uh climb trees um, reportedly there's some stuff in the liner notes saying that it's about the antichrist but to me that seems like it's kind of surface level i think there's a little more going on there in terms of more of a larger rejection of society societal constraints around religion yeah that song is probably the most abstract song on personal journals and it was Mm -hmm. the very last song that i record i wrote for it when i was in california in fact when i was about to leave the day before i was about to leave joe had made the beat for for climb trees Mm -hmm. Um, all I had was the chorus at the time, and then I, I wrote all the lyrics, and I recorded it, and um, I, I did several takes, and I, I like almost all the songs, I recorded it myself. I'm not an engineer, I don't really know what the fuck I'm doing, but they set up a microphone with a mixing table, so... I basically did it enough times where I, you know, I, it was fresh in my notebook. So I was trying to like get all the deliveries proper and um, blow out my vocals doing it so many times. And then finally someone comes in and, and I, I, t- I told him, I said, I can't get this to sound right. I mean, it sounds weird. It sounds different. And they told me, oh, the, the microphone is backwards. So I had to like, <laughs> and like, I was like, are you fucking serious? So they turned the microphone around. I was like, you know what? I don't need this song. Like, th- I'm I'm done. Like, I was already exhausted. I was ready to go home, fly back to Rhode Island, and um, I can't remember who. I know there was at least two people who were like, "Yo, this, you really should do this song." They're like, "This is probably one of the best songs that you've done," mm-hmm. and because t- to me it was so fresh and brand new at the time, I didn't have any kind of Distance great connection to it. To it. Mm-hmm. I just had I wrote it for what it was. I liked writing the beat. I liked the the switch up in rhythms and stuff, but 
I mean, to, I know I'm skirting your original question, but the fact of the matter is it was, it was done. I write a lot of my lyrics the way that you just explained how you interpreted the song, but mm. it is, and I did find it funny where I was like, this would be a good, um, the way I, I closed it out. It is kind of like an antichrist. Like I want you all under my broken wings, mm -hmm. but overall that's, that song touches upon way more than that. Well, there's a, there's a cute little sample midway through that I like that, that I like because I can appreciate and if it's the one point if it established where you were coming from when it came to relationships when it came to your position when it came to feminism it's it's kind of broad basis but it's also one of those steps that was pushing it put, that would push hip hop out of its comfort zone <laughs> what the, I hate men yeah was that the one uh -huh. All right, because we, we were just going through the records and um, randomly put the needle down on that part of, because uh, it's a musical, yep. um, and that part played, I was like, we need, to, we need that, we need that. <laughs> so then we just haphazardly threw it inside of, uh, of the song, which breaks up the track. It's not like it's even, we don't like skillfully blended, mix it into it, the rhythm. It no, drops yeah, in well. Just, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it, was, uh, it just was one of those happy accidents, which again, I'm very, um, I'm very privileged to experience. All right. So one thing that I've noticed about the album, and this is something I've noticed going pretty much across a large number of songs is a theme surrounding almost like a return to childhood. Because there's a lot of, ch well, between the childhood framing in terms of a bunch of the field recordings, there are specific lines that will pop up around songs like Message Sent and Specialist. And then by the end of Runaways, where you get the kid noise comes back in. And But you're also not somebody who puts his, your childhood in any sort of nostalgia. There's not rose-covered glasses here. So right. how, what would you think about that? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, when I went into making the record, I... It, my whole life led up to it, um, mm -hmm. which again is why it's insulting and ridiculous every time someone asks me to do a personal journals part two, mm -hmm. because I need to live a whole new life, um, at least 24 years of it before I can do another personal journals. But everything mm -hmm. that I do after personal journals is a branch from that tree. And, um, the childhood stuff that I put in personal journals, it, some of that appears on other records mm -hmm. and it does appear on other records. Uh, some of the types of recordings that I saved over the years that I felt like, I don't know why, but my whole life I had saved everything, everything that was recorded. If I was lucky enough to just get an audio recording of some type of interaction and I saved it all. And I've always kept my a mind open as to where I could place it. And I never forced those recordings. I never forced snippets, but when I felt like it perfectly fit, I was like, bam, wow, I found a home for this thing that I've held on to for 30 years. It has a home now. So um, whether that's great or dumb, it doesn't matter. It's how I did it. And that's how a lot of things in personal journals make sense to me that other people probably don't even consider when they hear it. They don't realize exactly what the source is from uh, what they're hearing. And um, cause a lot of it is for me, you know, and, and I'm doing it. I'm doing songs that I know I'm going to perform probably forever. If mm -hmm. as long as I'm a performance artist and an entertainer. So I need to also make things interesting for me. Okay. Um, and that actually kind of leads into one thing, because we've talked about some of the abstract songs, um, like Climb Trees, I put Cup of Tea in a similar state, although I do think Cup of Tea is a little bit more straightforward to figure out. Um, but you've never described your material as puzzle songs. Like, I know some artists do, like, in terms of they've got certain songs where, the, where they're so mastered, they're so cloaked in ambiguity, you can't figure it out. Um, right. But you're also not a person to t who t seems to take shelter in ambiguity. Like you're, you're comfortable with other broader interpretations. Um, right. So I, I'm not sure how to get to a question <laughs> with this, but I think I think a lot of it speaks to. Does it speak to a comfort with the material that you're able to say it can be interpreted broadly, or is it just it's out there? Go have a go at it. <laughs> 
I think going into the writing process with the understanding that it's going to be interpreted several ways, no matter what is Mm -hmm. good. um, I've always understood that. And I I know once the music is out there, it's not necessarily mine anymore. It's, it's whoever listens to it and however they take it and how they interpret it. So sometimes I'm, I'm trying to be very obvious and I'll be very specific, Yep. but yeah, overall, I would say I do leave room for interpretation and I love hearing how people interpret the material and what dots they connect. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes it takes life experience or, you know, certain things before it all clicks, before things that I say click, they'll, they'll need to experience something in their life before they can go back and hear it again and say, Oh shit. Now I get that. I get that. You know? And I'm lucky enough to have stuck around this long where people who once hated on my shit (laughs) would humbly come back and say, Hey man, it's like, I get it now. Like I get that. And I, I really appreciate that on the flip side. There's always people who are like, Oh man, I listened to you when I was in high school. What the fuck are you still doing around? You know? So do you think that there's some <laughs> level of like there's from in terms of drawing those connections, it's not just a purely logical exercise. There's an emotional comprehension and logic that comes with the interpretation of some of the songs. There should be. Yeah, mm-hmm. there should be. Um, and you mentioned cup of tea and the, the whole puzzle stuff. Uh, yeah. Cause that was popular at the time when people were exploring, um, more literary techniques in hip hop writing. And, mm-hmm. uh, and when, once people realized, Oh, I could make it a thing that they have to figure out. And as mm-hmm. that became, a you know, <laughs> yeah, it was, it almost was a fad, like a quick fad. I, I mean, it's wonderful to do if you can do it properly. Um, but not if that's your gimmick and not if that's like the only thing that you do, it's almost like at a certain point you're, you're just killing your own creative process by just coming up with riddles. And that's that I have no interest in that, but it's fun to do. Like I, I like, sometimes I like punchlines, but I would not dedicate an entire, my career. If people dedicate careers to it, you know, like that's how people get trapped in the whole battle scene because you have to, you have to think with a certain type, you have to have a certain type of mentality when you're in the battle scene, when you're writing battle raps, it's like, you're looking for these quips. You're looking for these quick punchy things that people will go oh but if that's how you um made your made your name if that's that's how you built your fan base and that's what they expect from your music you're forever stuck in just doing these 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 punchlines all the time and you never exercise other creative muscles in your head and you're stuck man you're you're stuck and a lot of those people just could not they're dinosaurs now. They could not exist like beyond 99, 2000, 2001. And people who made puzzle rap, people who just made puzzle rap, they just got lost in their own obscurity. You know, they, they got lost in their, like no one cares. If you can't do other things, you have to be able to flex all different types of muscles. Um, and I, I can also remember, uh, cause you know, obviously slug from atmosphere was in the mix around that time. Yep. He hated puzzle rap. He just <laughs> fucking hated it. He was like, I don't want to have to guess what your song is about. And then several years later, he's the most puzzle rap motherfucker. Like, I love I love you, Sean. I do. But now when we listen to your music and I like if he'll play me a song, there's been instances well, he'll play me a new song and then look at me, he's like, Do you know what that's about? <laughs> and I'll be like, That's whatever you said it was. There's no puzzle raps here. It's like, no, actually you know, it's about, I can't, I can't even, I can't divulge about stuff like that. It, it's a, it, it's a pivot that comes with time, but I yeah. think one thing that's interesting that where some people will drift across certain muscle memory, do you think that the, the emotional core within your music has kept you from falling into one of those lanes? Um, hmm, I guess so. I, I, I was always, I was very um, cognizant of it. I wasn't, it wasn't by chance I didn't fall into it. <laughs> I was very, very sure to not get boxed in. And um, again, I was I never took anything for granted <clears throat> because I knew it was just 
a series of happy accidents that I was prepared enough to take advantage of. Absolutely. And I needed to respect that, and I needed to to make sure I made the most of it. So that included me not falling into a box or a trap that would disallow me from being a different thing from time to time. So with the box of happy accidents that help comprise personal journals, obviously you're very, you would never want like the personal journals too, and trying to replatform in that way. It's not something that you could see yourself doing in that lane. But do you ever think that in terms of clearing the floor, building a replatform for an idea going forward, do you think that that would ever come off or be released in the future? I, I do think so. And I hope so. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's definitely uh, albums that I've been creating in my head over mm-hmm. over a decade now, um, mm-hmm. at least one that it just would take a different kind of perspective from the listener's po- point of view to, I think, um, appreciate and accept and receive mm-hmm. without calculating all else they know about the Sage Francis character mm-hmm. and. Like I said, context is important. So if I come out with something that's just so off the wall, but people are interpreting it as a Sage Francis uh, continuation, the lifeline of Sage Francis albums, there's Uh stuff that I do. And that's why Epic Beard Men makes sense. That's why I love, I was able to put a whole different persona, not a whole different, but it allowed me to do different types of things. Yeah, not even an evolution, just a... Just a little quantum leap over to the like ne- you know parallel universe where I can be a little different and have a different kind of uh, mm-hmm. slant on on what I mean and what uh, what certain things are are meant to uh, to do. So um, yeah, I, like I, mm-hmm. I know I'm I speaking of ambiguity i know i'm being very ambiguous but i can't speak in specifics about something that That's fine. i don't yeah i don't know how to present it yet so mm-hmm. what i need to do is really maybe it, lock myself up for 20 days um i can't do that though because i you know i've got my <laughs> wife and kids and mm-hmm. the, I love them and I do a lot of dishwashing. So that's important too. That is absolutely important. We'll we'll see. I just got to work out my daily schedules. I'm still figuring that out. And once I do boom, but I also have another Sage Francis album in the works that I'm very excited about. Um, And I'm working with a close friend who I've worked with for over 20 years who, and uh, other people as well. And it's just the fact that I can still do that, still work with people who inspire me and I never um, feel pressured to like work with a person that I don't totally care about. Uh, when you're at the you stage know, of your I'm, career, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm grateful for that. I'm very grateful. Mm-hmm. So, okay, this that runs through my primary list of questions. I think we got a little. I think we got deeper. I think we got yeah. deeper this time around. That's good. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you very much for coming on board. I I'll have some additional stuff afterwards where I'll when I'll discuss a little bit more of my final thoughts on the album and the series. Um, still a great album. Still one I think is one of your best. <laughs> and okay. it, and if you if anyone has not at this point checked out Sage Francis's Epic Beer Ben collaboration, this was supposed to be fun. It's one of the best hip hop albums of the year, hands down. <laughs> Oh, real? Yeah. He's only got two competitors, and th- it's stiff competition, but uh, he, he and B. Dolan are really doing well there. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Anything else you'd like to plug here while while the while the avenue is open? Um, just the fact that we're doing as much as we can uh, in a very volatile industry. In, mm-hmm. So Strange Famous Records is the record label. Uh, strangefamous.com for all your weirdo hip-hop needs we are a boutique label we do keep things very in-house and very intimate shout out to storm davis for helping keep that ship afloat and all the volunteers who come in just on the strength of the love for the label and and do work that we couldn't pay for (laughs) that they deserve that's fantastic man once again we have sage francis here thank you so much for stepping in a second time i really do appreciate it all right mark (laughs) have a good one All right, cheers.
You know, this is the point where after a lengthy discussion, I'm supposed to come back here with a grand revelation surrounding what was discussed, given how much we touched upon theme and sound and his origin and some big ideas. And yet in every moment of playing cultural critic and amateur historian here that's come with putting together resonators this year in particular, I'm not sure I've hidden much of a way of a conclusion beyond a greater appreciation of the art and artists who forged the way ahead in uncertain times. Kind of relevant now. And maybe, you know what, that's enough. Shine enough light upon what was once forgotten and some larger fields and pray that somebody listens. Which is one reason it's been a little bit dispiriting to see my larger audience not seem to care all that much about the sort of series. Now, maybe it'll change and evolve with the years ahead, but for now, I think this is a good note to end off Resonators. Again, at least for now. And on the high note, you know what? A light 9 out of 10. A remarkable and foundational piece of music that remains as challenging and striking to this day. But I think, like many things, this series needs a different sort of consideration going forward. And I'm looking forward to refining that. In the meantime, though, hell, if you get a chance, if you got this far, make sure to check out personal journals because, especially today, it's hard not to see Sage Francis' legacy dig deep and I really want to be here for it. So take the time, check this out. It's something special. But beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. If you'd like to like and subscribe and want to see more, I'd be happy to say that. And by the way, if you get a chance, go follow Sage Francis on Twitter and social media. Go check out his album, it, This Was Supposed to Be Fun by Epic Beard Men that he did with B. Dolan earlier this year. It really is one of the best hip-hop projects to come out this year. And I've got a link to that in the description down below. Once again, I have to thank Sage Francis for being so patient with me and putting together these interviews. It's really been something special real dream of mine i'm really appreciative of all that beyond that anything else i might be able to do you already heard that piece but hey if you actually want to subscribe to my patreon or to see more of what's coming up on my schedule or help just keep this show running or maybe even check out other videos links on the card right over there but till then i'm mark you're watching resonators on spectrum pulse and i'll see you next time